All right, screen recording is on. Let me get this one out. Is that? All right. <clears throat> and just in time too, it is at 12.01. So do we have any questions about the homework assignment that is due on Wednesday? No questions. Uh, has anyone started on the homework assignment? I know some people have, but are there any questions? Are there any questions about the homework assignment? So for people who normally sit over here, the projector still has a, the bulb still requires replacement. So, you know, this may be a little bit more slanted as an angle. Is that okay? Yep, go ahead. Class, right? Well, unofficial, you know, basically I just go like, okay, if you have questions, we can, there are no classes after this. I kind of have to go by two o'clock or so, but I do have a little bit of time. Yep. But if it, but if it's related to the homework assignment and most other students can benefit, I can answer those questions in classes. That's up to you. All righty. Any other questions? Any particular questions about the homework assignment? Nope. Okay, well, if you have not started, I would definitely recommend getting started with it, you know, um, you know as quickly as possible because you know, this one is not gonna be, it will take some time, okay? I'll just put it that way. It's gonna take some time. All righty, you guys ready? All right, cool. <clears throat> so we're getting back to the omega function that we I kind of talked about a little bit before. So the, the omega function is defined in two ways in here. One is the base case, which is you know, what happens when um, this is the one that we want to talk about first is the base case. So the base case is you know, omega zero of some set T, and it always returns a set with an empty tuple. So let's go ahead and try to kind of remind ourselves you know, what is big omega. Big omega returns a set of permutation outcomes. When you have an experiment that involves multiple trials, each trial is to remove something from a set, choose something from a set. <laughs> but the ordering of things getting chosen from the bag matters, okay? And that's why we are counting permutation nations. Combinations is basically means you know, the ordering does not matter, and permutation means the ordering is important. So are we good so far in terms of you know, uh, the terms of you know, permutation versus combination? You can think about the permutation as a tuple. Basically, ordering is important, and then you can think of a combination as a set where ordering is not important. Is that okay? All right. So that's what the zero is for. You know, this number here as a subscript is telling us how many trials are we planning to have in a particular experiment. The parameter T is a set. In other words, this number, if I look at the most general format, which is omega subscript I of T, it is basically asking what is the permutation outcome set of starting with T as the items in the bag, and we have I trials. In other words, we remove I items from the bag of T where ordering is important. How many ways can we get things out of the bag where ordering is important? That's what omega I of T is asking. So in a very specific case, we're asking, we, I give you a bag of T, it can have you know, any number of elements, okay? It can have a hundred elements, it can have five elements, it may even have, in this case, zero elements. It doesn't matter because you have no, no trial. Basically, I give you a bag, I give you a little you know, test tube or a tube and say, remove nothing from the bag and give the tube back to me. Okay, so when you give the tube back to me, what do you think the tube has? There's nothing in it. It is an empty tuple. Is that okay? And that's why, by definition, this is where the recursion ends because there's nothing else I can do at this point, okay? So now we look at the recursive definition <clears throat> and the recursive definition is down here. This is the recursive definition. 
which is basically asking, what if I is not zero? What if I is greater than zero? Then what do we do? Well, in that case, we have this big union thing. Why do we have this big union thing? Because it depends on what I am choosing out of the bag. Okay. So to understand this part, okay, I'm trying to explain this using a multiverse you know, setting. Okay. Are we ready for the multiverse? Okay. So let's say the bag has three items. Okay. It has A, B, and C in it. Those are the three items <clears> in the bag. So now we'll go ahead and look at three parallel universes, where in the first parallel universe, Tech is going to be picking item A out of the bag for the implicit test tube. In parallel universe two, Tech is picking item B and putting it into the test tube. And in parallel universe C, uh, three, Tech will pick item C and put it into the test tube. So now we have three parallel universes. Is that okay? And in each case, the, the idea of a recursion is being lazy. Because in each universe, okay, let's say we are talking about this you know, uh, prime, okay, you know, if you watch your DC or DC uh, graphic novels, you know, prime is you know, where we are, right? You know, so in that particular universe, I pick the you know, item A and put it into the test tube. But the experiment says, you know, oh, but you're supposed to choose three things out of the bag and you know, give me the test tube, uh, two things, sorry. One of these two. So two things out of the tube and give me the test tube pack. But I'm lazy. I go like, um, I only want to do one item. How about you, you know, I'll, I'll give the sub problem to you. It's like, okay, Matthew, can you tell me how many different ways can you choose one item? Because there's only one trial left. Okay, because the original number of trial is two. I performed one trial already. There's only one trial left. So I'm going to pass on the sub problem to Matthew and go like, Okay, so you figure out how many ways there are to choose one item out of the remaining items of the bag. I chose A already, so the bag would only have B and C left in it. So when I gave the bag to Matthew, it would only have B and C in it, and the test tube would already have A in it already because I put that in there. Is that okay? So now the universe has to split again, okay? This first you know, universe or the first parallel universe now has to split into two parallel universes because Matthew is going to say, oh, but there are two ways to proceed with this. I could choose item B or I could choose item C, right? So each one will generate its own parallel universe. So when Matthew is done you know, with his parallel universes and he says, Okay, according to me and all myself in all the parallel universes, uh, we can end up with B in the test tube and we can also end up with C in the test tube. Now I have to merge that into you know, the first parallel universe, which is the one where I started with A. So I go like, oh, so that means you know, the second item can be following A can be B or the second item following A can be C. So that's kind of how this works, okay? The recursive you know, call of omega here is to basically say, okay, I just took care of item E. So what is left in the bag is T minus the set of E. But at the same time, because I took care of one trial, so the number of trials left is gonna be I minus one. Is that okay? Does everybody understand the recursive call of big omega? So now the question is, uh, what do we do with the recursive call of big omega? Well, not too much because you know I take e already, so that means you know the tuple is going to be e combined with whatever this is returning. And because if this returns you know two items, and I'm picking only one item, there are two ways as a total you know of starting with this <coughs> and whatever is you know and end, ending up with this one. So I use like, the Cartesian product operation to basically say, okay, for everything on this side, combine with everything on that side, but ordering is important. So are we doing okay so far? This is kind of a more intuitive uh, explanation of the recursive definition. Is that okay? All right. 
So now we take a look at the big U notation and go like, um, but I'm not really sure what the big U notation is doing here. Well, intuitively, it is basically looking at each item that we generate out of the loop and say, okay, for each item that we generate out of the loop, let's make a big union of all of those things. So intuitively, that's what it's doing. But we also used um, a recursive definition of big union itself. And it is, I think here. <clears throat> so the, the recursive definition of big union looks like this, which is basically a follow up of all of the other big notations that we have used. So in this case, you know, the big union notation um, that says, you know, for each element of X, you know, let's do a union of all the F of E of you know, these elements. And the result is if X is an empty set, it's easy. I have nothing to report back if X is empty already. Because if X is empty and I say for each element of X do blah, 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 and do a unit of everything, there's nothing to do because if X itself is empty, so I have nothing to return either. Is that okay? All right. What if X is not an empty set? What if X is a set is not empty? Then, then we have to rely on D of X to pick one thing out of the set first. Now, by the time we get to the else value of the ternary expression, we know that X is not empty, which means I should be able to choose one thing out of the entire set. That's what the function D is doing, is every single time you call D with a particular set, it always returns exactly the same element. Which element? We don't care, okay? It just has to be consistently one particular element. So what do we do with the this one here? This is taking care of one thing in the original set of X. What about, what about the rest of X? Well, we do a, we do, we do a recursive call of big union where you know the set is no longer you know x itself, it is x minus the set of d of x, because I just took care of that, right? But then you know we have to apply f of e to every single one of these elements and then union all of those things together. So that's the recursive definition of big union, as opposed to the more intuitive way of saying, oh, we are just generating a bunch of stuff using a loop and then big you know, and then union everything together. This is a, another way to look at this using a recursive way of looking at it. So are we good so far? Yes? So how do we combine these two, right? Because now the question is, we have <clears throat> omega i of t defined like this, and then we have the big union you know, thing defined like this. So the combination is, well, we'll just combine these two. So now the question is, how do we apply that? And this is what I spent the previous two hours or so, you know, doing, because what I did was originally I was doing this by hand and I go like, no, that is, that's not what I want to do, doing it by hand. So I wrote a program to do it, <laughs> to generate the result. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Um, Oh, I actually, I put the, I put this line at the, at the wrong line. So let me fix that first. All right, there we go. That makes more sense. All right, there we go. All right, so what I want to do is to kind of focus on the right-hand side. And you know what? I forgot to close the paren here. I can fix the program and regenerate everything, but I think it's probably better off just to say, yep, I made a mistake here, forgot about the close paren here. So this is what we start off with. And at this point, f of e is defined to be whatever that is in the big U notation, which is you know, the set that only consists of e, Cartesian product with a uh, big omega, and then I minus one is supposed to be in a subscript. Okay, I totally kind of mess up this part here. I think I've made the wrong notation. So I can fix that and then we publish this, okay? But basically I ended up writing a program to show each step of what happens for each step here. So I do the recursion and then I trace the recursion all the way down to when omega zero is needed, which is down here. And that returns a set of, um, 
this is not right either because it's supposed to come back with a uh, empty tuple. Okay, so I got quite a few things to fix deal with my program, but the end result is correct. Okay, so after all of these traces, you know, I was still trying to fix all of these things when I got people coming into my office asking questions. I'm not referring to you. I'm talking about the person who was before you. Um, so anyway, uh, it did generate the correct results. Okay, it's just that you know, the steps in between were not explained correctly in the algorithm. All right, so for those of you, and I suspect some of you may be interested in the algorithm. Okay, so I can show you the algorithm itself. So this is the algorithm. Um, I define D of S in JavaScript. I define big union using the recursive definition. And you know, all of these console.log, those are the same thing as C out in C++. That's what is generating the text that you saw earlier in Joplin. And you know, they're, they were not formatted correctly because it's a little bit hard to track all of these things. Okay, you know, I do admit when you're typing in LaTeX, it's a little bit hard to visualize at the same time, you know, whether I close the phrases and the parentheses correctly. So, um, but ignoring all the console.out or console.log, and then I define, you know, big omega. This is basically the definition of big omega. And once again, the complexity here does not come from the definition. It comes from all the console.log, where, where I have to show partially when you apply this, this is the result that you get. And I have to translate that into the notation that I use in the lecture, you know, so that it has a one-to-one -one correspondence. So I'm gonna have to fix that because it's not giving you the correct result. Um, but basically, Okay, the bottom line, what is the bottom line? The bottom line is, if I go back to the expression here, I mean, the bottom line is I actually you know, uh, implemented this particular definition combined with this particular combination in order for the program to generate the correct result here, which is the set of all the possible permutations of you know, choosing X number of items out of you know a particular set. So it is mathematically correct. I just you know, checked I basically you know, ran the algorithm to make basically make sure the logic is correct. Is that okay? So for more human readable format, <laughs> I was doing the human readable format here. Um, this is this is done by hand, okay? This one is not generated by a computer. So um, omega 2 you know, which means you know, we are choosing two things out of the set ABC is going to be in, this is using the big U notation, F of A union with the big U of BC, F of E. And uh, F of A is defined to be this thing here. It's basically using the same definition that I have used in the lecture note over here. Okay. So here's the bottom line. If I tell you to find, um, if I give you a problem like this, can you do it by hand? Hmm? Well, something like uh, maybe, okay, how about, uh, okay, I cannot use the whiteboard because there are people online. Oh, this is also a good time to remind people who are online that each person has three allowances so I think some people are getting pretty close to using up all free allowances to participate online, which means the next one will count as an absent. So just kind of keep track. I keep track of all of that stuff, you know, in um, Canvas. So, but I do want to remind people there's a limit. All right, so to answer your question, so can you, so Omega 2, okay of A, B, C, D. So at least you'll give me, can you track at least a portion of how you compute the result of this? I mean, we kind of know what it should look like. The question is, do you know why it looks like that based on the algorithm? How many items are you Well, what do you, well, we only chosen one item per trial, but there are only three trials in this case. 
So this is the same thing as having a bag of four unique marbles, and then you are choosing two marbles out of the bag. But sequencing or ordering is important. So in this case, how many items do you think, or how many permutations is the result of this? In other words, if I were to apply the cardinality operator around this and say, I don't really care about the actual permutations. I just want to know how many permutations. What would be the number? 16. Not 16. It would be 12 because you have four options for the first one. And then after for each option of the first marbles that you put into the tube, there are three options to choose the second marble of the tube. Isn't it true about a number of elements? It is not. Because, because it is without replacement. Because once we choose a marble, we don't put it back into the bag. Oh, so that's with the replacement. Correct. All right. So let me um, let me do this. I'm going to start up uh, Zerno plus plus. In Unix or Linux, there is a device called the no device. Which where you can dump everything to it just you know, it's just basically a black hole of stuff, and it gives us you know this Zerno. I'm gonna have to move this one to my PC side so I can draw on it, and then we have to start another script which is mirroring that where you can see it. Uh, stash it this one over here. Now we have talked about this already in the past, okay? Um, which is a way to visualize, you know, what we just talked about. Okay, so let me do one more thing. There's another script I have to fix the coordinate system of the stylus. All right, so now we are ready to go. There we go. Okay, so when we first start, okay, this is you know the original single universe. So in this case, I'm talking about the you know, four items and we have two trials, okay? So in the first trial, there are four possible ways to you know, put that item into the two because you know, we can choose item A, B, C, or D. Does that make sense? So the first item in the tube that I choose out of the bag and put into the tube, the tube can be A, B, C, or D. Now, if I did choose A as the first item, then the second item can only be B, C, or D. If I choose, if I had chosen B to begin with, then the second item can only be A, C, or D, because B is already chosen. So does that explain why it is four times three and not, and not four times four? Because it is without replacement. Whatever ends up in the tube, I don't put it back into the bag to be chosen again. So it means in duplication that we can choose A or B and A. Hmm? We cannot choose A and A. That is correct. So C is the same way. You have you can have A, B, or D as the second item. And then for D, we can have A, B, or C as the second item. So that means if you look at this particular leaf node here, it gives us A, B as a tuple. And then we have an AC as a tuple all the way down to here, where we end, where we end up with DC as a tuple. Is that okay? All right. So now the question is, if I do want to end up with AC, AC, AD, BA, DC, BD, and so on, all the way up to down to the last one, which is DC, do I really need those complicated recursive definitions? The answer is no. Okay. You can set up a double loop here and you know, be, you know, get it done pretty easily. But the problem with a double loop is the moment I say, what about choosing three items out of a bag of four things? Then you have to be very busy because you have to add another level of loop. In other words, you cannot parameterize the depth of this tree if you're using nested loops as an approach, okay? So if the number of files is fixed, you know, then yes, nested loops can get this done rather easily. But if you are dealing with a case where the number of levels, which is the number of trials is not static, instead it is dynamic, then 
the recursive definition is far more flexible because it allows you to say, well, just tell me how many trials you want. I mean, I'm good either way. Yep. Is this static? Hmm? Is this static? Well, this one is a illustration of what happens when this is basically <clears throat> giving you omega, oops, is giving you omega two of the set A, B, C, D. But there's no, there's no such thing as static or not in this case, because this one shows you how we got each permutation. So I cannot say whether it's static or not. Um, what would like a static or dynamic example look like? Okay, so the dynamic approach of the algorithm from the algorithm perspective was what you see what you see earlier from my oh okay I see I'm confusing myself because I saw the the cursor flying on the other side. So this is the recursive definition. If I just ignore all the uh, console.log, in other words, I don't generate all the intermediate results. This is the recursive way, which is also, this is basically the JavaScript version of, where's my browser here? So that what you saw earlier is the JavaScript version of this, which is the big U notation defined recursively, and also the big omega notation here that we have defined. That is dynamic, it is recursive. But if you want to use a double loop here the, the method, you can do so as well. Would the double loop be considered a static version? That would be static because it's it because it depends on because once you write a double loop, you know, meaning you have a for loop and then another for loop inside of it, that means you you can only handle two trials. The third trial would require yet another for loop nested within the second layer of loop. And so that means that's what I meant by static, which means you're, which is basically saying the, the program, the text of the program, the source code, hard codes the number of trials that you can do with. Yep. All right. So are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. And I do understand and that the notation itself you know, can be a beast sometimes. This one is not quite as bad as the next one. The next one is much worse. This one here is much worse because you can see, you know, it has nested big U notation and, and the element of here, this is, the recur this is where the recursion is. In other words, the recursion is coming from, the, it's giving you the set to choose from, choose items from. And as opposed to the current one that we are looking at, where the recursive part is over here. All right. So let's do some counting here. Okay. So if I go back to the picture, the tree, oh, that's not what you're seeing. There's my, oh, I just passed there. There we go. Okay. So if we look at the tree from this perspective, and if, let's just say that I'm not really interested in knowing the actual permutations. I just want to know the number of permutations, okay? So how can I figure that out, okay? So let me, let me just write here, okay? Let me write what the question is, okay? So let's say we have omega i of some set t, which is the notation that I used in the notes. If I'm only interested in the, in the cardinality, is there a way to calculate the cardinality with, if I allow you to use factorial, okay? Is there a way to do this calculation you know, with, uh, without doing you know, crazy recursion like what I did earlier to get all the permutations? In other words, you're trying to make use of the structure of the tree to help you decide, hmm, I wonder if there is a way to do this. Yes. Cardinality of two times the cardinality of two minus one. Something like that. Okay. All right. So yes. Is it um, t factorial minus i factorial? Close. Okay. So what we want to know is to say yes. Go ahead. Is it t factorial? Or, oh, sorry. Uh, no. 
for mine. <laughs> it's T factorial divided by I factorial, right? You're getting close, but not ex uh, T factorial divided by what? I factorial? I that is correct. Okay. Let me think about it one more time. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, because it's like four factorial mm -hmm. is four times three times two times one, and then I yep. is the two and the one. Yep. So, so, so using yeah. this notation, let's just define n as the cardinality of t. Okay, just because it's 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 handy to have n. Okay, is that okay? So I'm defining n as the cardinality of t. What you notice about the fan out of the first layer? No. Number of questions. Num it's n, right? Yeah, n. So the fan out ratio is n over here. What about the fan out ratio of the second tier, of the second layer? n minus one. Very good. Okay. So in this case, we have n times n minus one. It becomes the cardinality of the total number of permutations. Is that okay? So the question now is, how do I work with this? So we know um, the this cardinality is going to be n. Whoops, I just uh, is n times n minus one times n minus two, and the question is. When do we end? When do we stop this multiplication? In other words, when I have two layers, I stop when I have n minus one. If I have three layers, I stop at um, three and so on. So I stop at n minus two. So what is the last number that we multiply in this multiplication? Yes. Uh, I was just gonna say to clarify, I don't think it's actually T factorial over I factorial, it's T factorial over t minus i factorial. It's t factorial divided by t minus i t minus i factorial. T minus i being in parentheses. Because like in the example of six, four, right? We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> so just intuitively, okay, you know, not using the entire notation, does that make sense to you? I being the number of experiments, if I have one trial, or oh, I should maybe correct myself, I is the number of trials in the experiment. If I have one single trial, it is n. If I have two trials, it's n minus one. If I have three trials, it's up to n minus two. So if I have, generally speaking, i uh, trials, it should be n minus i, the whole thing plus one. Does that make sense? Okay. And then you say, but Tech, you said something about factorial. This does not look like factorial. It looks like it has some effect of factorial, but it's not factorial itself, right? Okay, so let's just you know, copy this onto a new sheet, or we can just kind of scroll down the screen and look at this expansion here. So we have n times n minus one times n minus two times all the way down to n minus i plus one. That's the answer that we want. But it doesn't look like a factorial because factorial has to multiply all the way down to one. Then they go like, okay, um, would that be okay? One is the identity, uh, identity of multiplication, which means, hey, this doesn't change anything. Okay, what if I change the way I write this one into I n minus I? the whole thing factorial divided by n minus i, the whole thing factorial. Would that still be okay? That still spells one to me, right? Because you, you have the same value divided by the, the value itself, which, you, which gives us one. Is that okay? Then go like, okay, but that's a weird and unnecessary way to use factorial. If, if one is all we want, you know, why do we want to do it this way? Well, watch this, okay? This is the magical moment. What if I turn n times n minus one times n minus two all the way to n minus i plus one, all to be a part of the numerator? So what is my new numerator going to look like now? It becomes n factorial divided by n minus i 
the whole thing factorial. So we're we're done here. And there's a special name for this. This is called permutation. So this is also usually noted as P of choosing I from N, or if you're using a spreadsheet, it is spelled as permut, permutation. You start with N items and you're choosing I out of N. And you can actually do this using a spreadsheet. Hmm. Are we doing okay so far with this? Are we relating the picture to the intuitive formula? In other words, are we relating this picture to the intuitive multiplication? And then later on using algebra to relate this intuitive expression to the final form that we want, which is n factorial divided by n minus i, the whole thing factorial. Yes? What is the one factorial again? Hmm? The one is n minus i plus one. The n minus i plus one is one. You mean here? Yeah. Oh, that's just based on observation. That's okay. just you know, intuitively based on observation. Because in this case, n is four, right? And we stop with three. n times three is 12. And that's the number of permutations when you choose two items out of four. So I'm just you know, using this plus one here to make sure that we uh, stop at the right point. But, but that's based on observation. That's just looking at the tree structure and decide, okay, we don't stop at n minus i, we stop at n minus i plus one. All right. So now the question is, are you sure that works, tech? And we'll 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 try to check out some really kind of you know uh, tricky cases. Okay. So we're gonna say, um, let's try to figure out the permutation of we start with six items but I say, don't choose anything out of it, <laughs> okay? In other words, I give you a bag of marbles. It has six marbles in it. I give you a tube and I say, uh, choose nothing, do, you know, do not put anything into the tube and then give the tube back to me. The tube will be empty, which means there's one single outcome of an empty tuple. So we should be seeing this equaling to one here. The question is, uh, are we sure based on the equation? So now we look at this and we say, hmm, we have n factorial divided by n minus i factorial. What is n in this case? Six. n is six, okay, six factorial divided by, what is i again? Zero. i is a zero, okay. So we have six minus zero factorial. So that means we have six factorial divided by six factorial, which is one, huh. It does work out in this particular boundary case. A boundary case is basically a test case where it is at one extreme end of the possible values. So in this case, you know, having choosing zero out of six is one extreme end. Yes. I mean, what is n necessarily? N is the number of items in the bag. So in the previous example, we started with n equal to four because we have four items in the bag. Yep. So this one represents the empty double and test tube? Yes. So this means you know there's only one tube configuration that you can end up with, which is the empty tube. But that still counts as one tube configuration. Even though the tube itself is empty, it is a configuration of the tube. Having nothing. It is like counting folders, okay? So if you ask Windows to count the number of items within a folder, would an empty folder count as one item? An empty subfolder within a folder, would that count as, a, as one item? The answer is yes. Same thing here. It is a tube, which is a container, but the container has nothing in it. But nonetheless, there's one configuration of the container, which contains nothing. Yep. So what's the minimum? The minimum value n can have zero. So the minimum, okay, there are two numbers here. So are you referring to this number here, which is no, the, the, the cardinality of the number is one, right? You can choose the choosing it. Yeah, one is within the small C. Yes. Always have one. That is correct. 
Okay, so now we want to plug this back into the previous example. Okay, so the, in the previous previous example, we had four items, you know, in the picture. Okay, so I'm referring to this particular picture here, where we started off with A, B, C, D, and we have two trials. So we want to plug that in and see if we got the right number. Okay, so this becomes four factorial divided by four minus two factorial. Four factorial is 24. Let me see, four times three times two, yep, it's 24. Two factorial is just two, and this gives us 12. The question is, did we end up with 12 leaves in the previous picture? And the answer is, yep. We actually enumerated every single leaf in this case, and there are exactly 12 leaf nodes. So I just did some quick checking and make sure that this works. Are we doing okay so far with this? So if I give you the largest number, okay, if I want the largest number of permutations with a bag of four marbles, that means I have to choose four out of four, or at least four out of three, okay? So that means if I want to count the number of ways to choose three out of four items where sequencing is important, it would end up with exactly the same number as choosing all four out of four items. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so I got the same bag of marbles, A, B, C, D, right? But this time I give you an empty tube and say, I want to you know, choose three items out of the bag and put it into the tube. So the question is, how many ways can I choose three items out of the bag and put it into a tube where ordering is important because the tube has the same diameter as the marble. So once you put mar one marble in, it cannot change position with another marble anymore. Is that okay? So that's the, that's one question. So now we have four divided by four minus three, which is one factorial. Four factorial divided by one factorial is four factorial, which is 24. There are 24 ways to do it. And then the next question is, but what if I want you to choose four out of four marbles out of the bag? It will still be 24. Because the last item, there's only one item left in the bag. You don't have an option. When you don't have an option, the fan out in the, in the tree is going to be one. Okay, now. Why is it not one? Hmm? Why is it not one? Why is it? It's the same for item you over and okay. over and over. It's the same thing. So the best way to look at this is to draw this tree out. Okay, so we'll go ahead and erase. Is it okay for me to erase this part? Okay, so you might want to you know, write down the timestamp in case you want to reverse back to the point where this part is still there. Okay, all right, so we want to choose three out of four first. Okay, so we'll actually go ahead and complete this entire tree. If I had chosen A, B already, then I only have C, D left, right? If I have chosen A, C already, I have B, D left. If I have chosen A, D, then we have B, C left. If I have chosen BA, then I have CD left. I mean, you guys are getting the picture, right? You know, in this case, I have AD. In this case, I have what? AC. In this case, we have BD. In this case, we have AD. And then we have uh, AB in this case. And then we have uh, BC. Um, a, C, and then over here, we got A, B. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is, so how many lead notes do we have in this case? Choosing three items out of a bag of four. We got 24, how do we know? Because at the second tier, we, end up in, we ended up with 12 already. For each note at the second tier, we have two, children, so that means you know, the total is going to be 12 times 2, which is 24. So now if I extend this you know, and say, what if I want to choose four out of four items in a bag? Well, the last tier has no choice because at this point, I have chosen A, B, C already. There's only one item left in the bag. So to choose that one last item, I don't have a fan out other than one. 
So I only get D as the only choice. I only get C as a choice. I only get D as a choice, B as a choice, C, B, uh, D, C, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is getting a little boring. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if I want to ask you, you know, if I finish the fourth tier of this entire tree and I ask you, how many leaf nodes do I have? The answer is uh, the tag is the same as the previous one because the fan out ratio between the third and the fourth is only one. We, we got as many leaf nodes as the third tier. Does that make sense? So this is basically looking at permutation using a tree representation. And this is one of the reasons why 430 is a co-requisite of 440, because in 430, I'm fairly sure that you guys have started to talk about trees already. And this is just a very simple uh, use of the tree representation to look at how we count permutations. We good so far? All right. <clears throat> So now the next question is, what about combinations? In other words, what if we don't care about ordering? So I give you a bag that you choose from. I give you another bag and say, whatever you choose out of this first bag, put it into the second bag. Okay, so instead of a two, where your ordering is important, the second one is also just a bag. So now the question is, um, how do we handle that case? So once again, we'll, we'll try to look at the um, boundary cases. One boundary case is I give you four items in the first bag and I say, let's choose nothing into the second bag. How many ways can you end up in the second bag? One way because the bag remains empty because you're not choosing anything to put into the second bag. So the only way, the only outcome of the second bag is there's nothing in it, right? The other boundary case is to ask, I give you a bag of four items, A, B, C, and D. And this time, I want you to choose one by one, four times, okay? From the first bag and place it into the second bag. And then I ask you, what is the total number of outcomes in this case? There's only one because I just end up with exactly the same four marbles in the second bag. But how is it, why is it counted as only one when we have 24 over here? Because ordering does not matter, okay? When ordering does not matter, you're using a bag and it's like, okay, is the red marble in it? Yes. Is the green marble in it? Yes, and so on. Because when ordering is not important, I only care about the membership. There's no inherent ordering between the members. Does that make sense? That if I, if ordering is not important, the number of choosing four items out of four is one. Okay, what about uh, choosing only two items out of four? How many ways can I choose two items out of four when ordering is not important? Well, part of the answer is already here in the picture. So we can take a look at this picture here and we say, we can put A and B in the bag. We can put A and C in the bag. We can put A and D in the bag. And then we say, we can put P, B and A in the bag. We go like, but didn't we talk about that already? Because whether we put A in the bag first and then put B in the bag is the same thing as putting B in the bag first and then putting A in the bag. Because once again, ordering is not important. Which one you put into the bag first does not make a difference. So that means we are double counting things, right? Because this note here is really the same thing as this note over here. They're basically the same thing when you want to look at the number of combinations. And then this note here is the same thing as this note over here. I know this picture is going to look kind of busy now. AD is the same thing as DA, which is this one over here. Nope. Good thing we have undo here. I feel really sorry for people back in the old days when there's a chalkboard because there's no undo on the chalkboard. I can totally undo, copy, paste, and do all kinds of stuff here. All right, what about BC? So we got BC over here and then CB is over here. So these two are double counting. 
And then we have um, BD, which is double counted as DB over here. And then we have CD, which is double counted as DC over here. Oh, so are you telling me that there are only six ways to choose two items out of four? The answer is yes. There, there are only six ways to do it. Are we doing okay so far with this? All right. So now the question is, what about in general? How do we derive that equation? So we go to new page after. That one is called combination. So it starts with a C. We start off with N items. We choose I thing out of it. So the question is, ah, how do we get this? Well, let's go back to the previous page, okay? Because it looks like we can use an approach, okay? of looking at the number of permutations first, and then just divide that number by how many times we are counting the same thing over and over again. Does that make sense? Okay, go no like, okay, but four choose two is kind of tricky because four minus two is two itself, right? So what about four choose three, okay? What is that gonna look like? So we look at, this one is gonna look super busy, because, okay, I can choose a different color. So we have A, B, C over here, okay? So I'm just gonna highlight A, B, C. The question is how many uh, third level nodes would also represent just choosing A, B, C, but maybe in a different order? Well, let's try to spot all of those things, okay? Because we have an entire correct tree for up to the third level. So A, C, B. is another way to arrange these three items, right? BAC is one way to look at those three items. Um, BCA is another way, right? So BCA is another way. And then we have CAB as one way. And then we have CBA as the other way. Are we doing okay so far? Because I, the, the blue line is trying to figure out how many times are we counting exactly the same combination? In other words, how many permutations are really representing the same combination? That's what we are trying to find out here. Looks like there are six. Does that make sense to you that there are six ways of arranging three distinct items? And why would that make sense to you? Because if you just focus, if you just focus on A, B, C as the three items, then you generate the subtree to figure out how many ways can I arrange A, B, and C. <clears throat> All right, so let me erase a little bit more on this page. And then we can now say, okay, let's just focus on A, B, and C. So if I only have A, B, and C, I can choose A, B, or C as the first item. And I can choose B, C, A, C, A, B as the third, second item. Then I have no choice but to choose C over here, B over here, um, C over here, A over here, B over here, and then A over here. The tag, that's the same kind of tree that we generated earlier. Exactly. Because if you have a combination of you know, three items, then there are six permutations corresponding to the same combination. Is that okay? So that means if you look at the third layer of this tree here, which has 24 items, every six item corresponds to one combination. So what is the total number of combinations if I want to choose three items out of four? 24 divided by six, is four, very good. Does that make sense to you? Intuitively, does it make sense to you? If you ignore this crazy picture with trees and making you know, things out of the tree, but does, does it make sense to you there are only four ways to choose three items out of four when ordering does not matter? It makes sense because the only question is, which one am I missing? 
Okay, out of the four items, which one am I missing? How many ways can you miss one item when there are only there's a total of four items? There are only four ways to do it. So it makes sense from that intuitive perspective. Is that okay so far? Okay. So now we have this observation that go like, hmm, so we can start with the number of permutations and then just divide the number of permutations by the number of permutations for each combination. I know that sounds really kind of you know, staggered, but that's basically what we're asking, okay? So now when we want to derive the equation that we saw earlier, we go like, Maybe we can start with this, okay? The number of permutations of choosing i out of n, but then we'll be double counting stuff like what I just described. The question is, how many times am I over counting things or counting duplicates? What should I divide this thing with? I, okay? So that means, you know, for each i permute, I factorial permutations, they correspond to the same combination. So I have to divide this by I factorial, which means if you expand out the, the N choose I, this is also known as N choose I or N chooses I. So that becomes N factorial divided by N minus I plus one. Nope. I take it back because there's no plus one here when you're dividing it. So n minus i factorial times i factorial as the denominator. Okay, are we doing okay so far with this? Are we kind of getting an understanding of how it is derived? Because the path of the derivation also re relates to how the thing is defined. What are we really counting in that tree? Are we counting the number of nodes for each layer, or are we looking at things that are non-duplicating in terms of what is in that line? Are we doing okay so far? All right. So I think at this time we are ready to to take on the challenge related to um, lotto. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at the lotto game. So the lotto game says, you know, we have five numbers, right? And these five numbers is you have 69 to choose from, and you're choosing five out of those. So we have 69 chooses five to represent the number of ways you can choose the five numbers. Does that make sense? Because ordering is not important, okay? If you go to um, a convenience store and you say, I want to buy a ticket of one, two, three, four, five, and I want to buy another ticket of five, four, three to one, the clock is going to say, but they are the same, okay? You know, you're going to, it's going to be the same ticket. And that is correct, okay? Because they're considered identical. And then you have one extra number here, which is called the Powerball number. And there are what, 26 or 29? 26, okay, there are 26 out of this. So the total number of tickets that you can get, okay, the total number of tickets out there, unique tickets you can get is 69 chooses five times the 26. Does that make sense? Why is it multiplication again? Why are we not adding? Because for each way of choosing the first five numbers, there are 26 Powerball numbers to choose from, okay? So that multiplication has to do with the keyword of for each, okay? For each way of choosing the first five number, there are 26 ways to choose the Powerball number, and therefore we have multiplication. Are we good so far? So we want to look at this and go like, are we sure this is going to get us the same number, which is uh, close to 300 million or so? 292 million something, right? Well, we can we can test this, okay? So we'll go ahead and test whether this is the quickest way to get to the answer. And once we can confirm this, then we'll try to you know, address some slightly trickier you know, type of questions. 
which basically has to do with what if I just want to match like three of the five numbers and so on. So we'll go take a look at that. All right, so I'm just entering the combins and we have 69, choose five times the 26. And there we go, we have the 20, 292 million and something. Oh, so that's a pretty easy way to do the calculation. Cool. So now I go back to the picture that we have earlier. Oops, we cannot see it yet. There we go. So this time I wanna say, well, I don't want to win the jackpot, okay? You know, I'm not interested in the chances of winning the jackpot. I just want to see, you know, how many tickets would win like three of these numbers and, you know, and not the Powerball number. In other words, out of the entire ticket, I'm only matching three of the five winning numbers. <clears throat> that okay? So how many tickets would correspond to exactly that level of price? Okay, so what do you think? Let me write it, write it down here. Okay, so we want to match three of the five. I think these numbers are called the lucky numbers. And not matching the power ball or power number. The power ball number is this guy here. So this, these are the lucky numbers. All right. So if I want to look at the cardinality of these tickets, how do you think we should come up with that? Okay. So I'll, I'll go ahead and take some uh, possible answers here. So you have 69, choose three. Okay, so what is that gonna give us, right? This will give us the ways of uh, choosing three out of 69. But what about the numbers that are not matching? They are not accounted here, right? Okay, so that's not, that it's close. I mean, it has got the numbers in it, but it's not what we want. Um, we seldom do subtraction when we're dealing with this, this type of problem. Yep, go ahead. Oh, no, okay. So the way you think about this is to say, the way we do this calculation is we already know what the Powerball number is. We already know the five lucky numbers are, okay? We know those things already. So what we need to start with would be the numbers that match the lucky numbers, okay? We only need three of them to match. So that means out of the five lucky numbers, um, okay, this is another notation. I'm not gonna switch notation right now. So out of the five lucky numbers, we only need to match three of those. So that means out of the five lucky numbers, uh, this number here, the number of combination of choosing three out of five will give us the number of ways to choose the three lucky numbers out of the five lucky numbers. But one thing that most people forget is, what about those two other numbers? The not so, the unlucky numbers. We still have to find out how many ways can we put those unlucky numbers on the ticket. So what would those numbers be? It's a combination again. So the question, hmm? Well, we know we only have to choose two of those because you know, your ticket only has five numbers as a total, right? So three of those are already the lucky numbers. We just need two of those two to be the unlucky numbers. But out of the 69 possible choices, how many are unlucky? 69 minus five, which is 64. So the 64 is representing the number of total unlucky numbers out of the 69. And out of those 64, I need to pick two of those. Does that make sense? But we're not done yet because there's also the Powerball thing because every ticket has a Powerball number and we don't want to match, okay? We, we are trying to say, okay, what if I don't want to match the, the Powerball number? So there are 26 to begin with. There's one that is the chosen one, which means there are 
25 of the unmatching power ball numbers. So we have to multiply this by 25. So this would win a certain price. So the first thing we want to do here is to do a little quick calculation, and then we go to the Lotto website to double check and see if our number is correct, okay? So we basically say combin five, three, oops, five, three times combin 64, two times 25, okay? So in theory, there are 504,000 tickets that would match three of the five lucky numbers and not matching the power number, okay? So now we go to the website and see if that is the case, okay? So we switch to here. I think I closed, oh, we still have the Powerball <clears throat> URL here. And we want to go to odds, game odds. And this time we are looking at any three of five and not the Powerball by AD. One, one in five. So you got to take the number we found and divide by the total number. Right. Wait. Yeah, because the right. number we found was the number of possible tickets that win that. And the other number. Oh, we, we have to divide. Mm. So we can still have it. Okay. So five, what well, odd is? Oh, the 580 tickets. To match any three of the five. No, it's odds one, one in five. So oh, okay. Five gotcha. So it seems probably the right method. So we divide this by that? No, otherwise. Yeah, 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 right. right, well, yeah, that should give you five. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So there we go. Because this number here is the total number of tickets that will win that map, that will win that particular prize. But the website is publishing a number corresponding to what are the chances, well, okay, the reciprocal of the chances of getting that particular prize, which is one uh, divided by 580. And this number is not even a whole number because these two are whole numbers, but when you divide this one by this number here, you're guaranteed that you don't get up, end up with a whole number because you know, this one does not end with thousand, with a thousand. So right there, guaranteed not to end up with a whole number. <clears throat> so it all works out. So if you buy a price, it's the same thing, 10 bucks? Well, the the for every 580, you're probably going to get one that, that yeah. gets that. Yeah. <laughs> um, not guaranteed. Okay, so so let's not be ambitious, and we'll get down to <laughs> we'll get down to uh, this one over here. Um, none of the five, only the Powerball number. Okay, in other words, of the entire ticket. Okay, let me show the, the pictorial representation of the ticket first. Okay, so we are looking at this ticket here. So. To win that last tier of prices, none of these five numbers would match, and you're only matching the Powerball number. And most people think, oh, that should be easy. Um, there are only 26 possible choices for the Powerball number. So it would be one divided by 26. That should be the chances, right? That turns out not to be the case. Why? Because we need to to make sure every single one of these is an unlucky number. So that means of the 64 unlucky numbers, we have to choose five of those. That is the, that's the reason why you know, we cannot just say, oh, we just look at the Powerball number and ignore the rest of the ticket because you cannot just ignore the rest of the ticket. So why do we do 64 not 69? Hmm? Why are you using 64? Because out of the 69 numbers, five are the lucky numbers. I don't want to match any one of the five lucky numbers in this case, because we are looking at the last tier of the prices, which means you are not matching any one of the five lucky numbers. You're only matching the Powerball number. So now this one has to come from the 64 unlucky numbers. This one has to come from the 64 unlucky numbers. 
So that means in this case, the math, the way we the way we work out the math is going to be. Now, if you want to keep this format, you should, okay? Because what we are looking at here is five, choose zero here. Of the five lucky numbers, we want none of them. And then we multiply of the 64 unlucky numbers. We want five of those. And then when we look at the lucky number, we want the Powerball number. I, I misspoke, okay? When we look at the Powerball number, there's only one because only one of them is the winning Powerball number. So we want to look at this. This would give us the number of tickets that would win the last, the lowest tier of prizes, right? So we'll take a look at this and we switch to the spreadsheet. There we go. All right, so we look at Combin. I know, you know, five zero is just one, but it's good to keep the format. And then the next one is 64 choose five. And then the next one is one. So there are a lot of you know, tickets that can potentially win this particular prize. And if you want to look at the probability, then we are looking or the one in you know, blah, blah, odd. When you, when you look at the odds, it would be this number, the total number of possible tickets divided by the tickets that can get this particular prize. And it is 38.2, blah, blah. And then we switch back to the website and see if that is what we got here. Yep, they round it up to 39, okay. So now you understand how these odds are calculated, right? So that means on the average, assuming you're, yeah, go ahead. But of the 26 numbers, one is the chosen Powerball number, and we want to match that. So the way you want to look at this is to say, we already know what the winning, the jackpot ticket looks like. I just want to find out if I won, what are the chances of winning the last tier of the prizes? So I'm not looking at that individually because I'm looking at the number of tickets that can win me this tier of prices. And then I divide, you know, if I want the probability, I would divide the number of tickets meeting this criterion by the total number of tickets. That would give me the odds or probability or chances, which is going to be a number that is between zero and one. But the um, model website want to give you the odds, which is expressed as one in blah blah, because this way people can understand it a little bit more. Because on the average, okay, it means on the average, if you have average luck, because some people are particularly lucky and some people are particularly unlucky, or so some people believe. But on average, if you buy third, every 39 tickets that you purchase, you will get this price points. That's basically what it's saying. One in blah, blah, blah means that, right? So for the second tier price, which is matching one out of the five lucky numbers and also the Powerball number, that happens every 92 times. Thing. For every 92 tickets that you purchase, you get one that can win this price. On average, On average yes. <laughs> and how, what, what is the reward of the last tier price? None of five. Uh, let me take a look. Uh, it has to show that somewhere. I think it's past winning numbers. Yeah, there you go. So they give you $4 back, which is the price of two tickets. But that happens only for every 39 tickets that you purchase. So you would have spent $78 to get $4 back. So 78 minus four is 74. So you will still be 40, $74 in the negative when you get that $4 back. Yep. If it's more than that, you have to share with everybody. You're the only person, that's a miracle to win. Yeah. 40,000 times. So Correct. But if you're sharing, then you're sharing the cost of the tickets as well of, as well as the reward. So it would just be, the ratio does not change. Yeah, yeah. It, it could be more. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if you're looking at the ratio, you know, that does not change. Yeah. 
So that's for the least tier price. And for the next tier, they give you five dollars. And what was the odd again? It's it's higher than that. It's almost double the 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 least tier. One plus Powerball. Okay, let's take a look. <clears throat> 92 is more than doubling the first one. They give you $1 more. <laughs> so you can do an average. I mean, you can do a weighted average and find out, you know, you know, assuming a particular jackpot, you can find out on the average, okay, you know, what is the return of buying a, you know, lotto ticket as a ratio, okay? You know, how much money do you spend and how much money do you get back? Yep. What happens if you got to use the overall odds of winning and how is it affected? Hmm? Oh, yeah. The overall odds of winning. It's of winning any of the things. Yeah. So over odds of overall odds of winning is adding the probability of all of these things, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let's let's try to calculate overall odds of winning using our spreadsheet. Okay, so so this is one thing that's great about using a spreadsheet is it is kind of programmable, okay? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll take these out, okay? So we'll calculate, um, you know, okay, so we'll take that out too. So we have five um, as the number of lucky numbers, and then we'll calculate the tickets of um, winning all five lucky numbers, but not the Powerball, and then winning, matching all five lucky numbers and also the Powerball. We'll do those two separately. So we have uh, Combin, um, there are only five out of five of the lucky numbers, and we also want to match, okay, I want to, I want to set this up in a way that is easy to uh, process later. So we want five, five out of five, because I want to refer to that cell um, of the winning, the lucky numbers. And then we want none of the unlucky numbers. So instead of a zero, I'm gonna say this is five minus this number here, okay? So this way, you know, I can now do something like this, okay? I can do uh, this number is this number minus one. So I can now do tricks like this. Oops, okay. Uh, hmm? Because you pulled the first uh, spectral six. So I'm going to equal this one minus one. There we go. All right. So we also need to include a zero okay, over here. All right. So now we need to look at whether we want the Powerball number to match or not. So if we want a Powerball the number to match, it will be this number times one. And then if we don't want a Powerball number to match, it will be this number times uh, 25, right? Okay, now we have to be careful not to sum over everything because there are certain things here that do not actually match a price. So now you have to do the sum. So we have to, uh, Okay, we can sum, okay, control uh, all five of five, all five of five and the Powerball number. So that works. Uh, four, four, and then we have three, three, and then two is special. So this is where I want to do it special. Uh, okay. Getting close. All right, so we want for the two, it's only the Powerball matching. So we want column C only for that one, C4. And then for one, same way, only the Powerball matching. And then for C6, it is the same way. All right, so we got this number and we have to divide the total number of tickets by this number. So that means we look at Combin, you know, that number we worked out earlier which is 69 choose five um, times 26. So now we look at this number divided by this number. And does that match? 
overall odds of winning. There we go. So that's how it's calculated. So this number is kind of tricky because it's basically saying if you buy every time you buy 25 tickets ish, you get something. So for every $50 that you spend, you get something. <laughs> I have better use for $50. Try tip at Costco is only $8, $8 a pound. That's, a, that's like six, at least six pounds of fry tip right there. But I get a lot more enjoyment. <laughs> All right, isn't that fun? I think it's kind of it's fun to study. Well, I mean, we have real life application of this stuff here. Um, yes, and knowing this stuff, you know, would hopefully change how people look at blog, right? It's like or gambling. Yeah, I mean, it's well, worse than gambling because there's an edge. Yeah. yeah, gambling is a little bit different because um, if you can count cards, you know, you can because in, in terms of you know those type of card games. There's a decision process, right? So by knowing and knowing the, pro the probability of distribution, you can choose or not to you know, whether to proceed or not to proceed with a certain decision. So you can change the odds of actually, you know, are you going to lose money overall speaking or let it, you know, win money overall speaking? This one is completely probabilistic because there's no way you can actually know any information ahead of time to inform you how to do Hmm? Many have slots for the household names. I mean, overall speaking, with every single game, assuming you cannot count, you know, cards and stuff out, the house always wins. Otherwise, you know, who's going to pay for those, you know, you know the electrical bill right. for all those neon lights? Oh, yeah, that's why they give you free drinks a lot of times. Because they want you to stay there. So, yeah. And they have, you know, arcades, you know, so that the kids, you know, can occupy themselves and the adults can play for as long as they <laughs> You guys have a good one? Yep. All right. See you on Wednesday. Don't forget the homework assignment. Yes. Yep. I have a question. I was wondering if you could look for CNFs. Okay. Hold on. Let me uh, get out of the recording first. <laughs>